I want to thank the Xavier um, team for making this happen um, and the great people of Cincinnati. But in particular, I just want to thank again Julie Garley for really uh, hustling from behind the scenes and making all of this work. Uh, she couldn't be here tonight, uh, but I can. So uh, I just want to thank her again. That's the video. Jolene, thank you. <laughs> we got that done. So, um, some of you may have heard me in Israel in previous trips, maybe. Um, how many of you have heard me this week in one of those talks I maybe gave? Are there any students here that have heard me this week? Great. So I'm happy. So I'm going to start with something I did with some of the students here, just to um, open this up and put this into context. Hello. Hi. Um, so I am from Israel. I am Jewish. This is a Jesuit institution. So I don't think there's any better way to start the stock with this analogy. What's the name of this person? Come on. So this is a person who's sitting in an environment which is in black and white. Sure is not the woods around Ohio. What is that environment? That's a desert. That's right. And he is thinking about a place that is not a desert, <laughs> maybe. What is that place he's thinking about? That is far remote, maybe the opposite of the landscape that he is in. Hmm? A lake, water, washlands. So that's not where he is, but that's what's in his mind. What's he holding? A map, a compass. Okay. Right. So, um, this person is in the desert. He is thinking about another piece of land. We'll figure out which land in a bit. He's holding a map as a compass. And I really think that the Bible is one of the most entrepreneurial books ever. And that's something we share in common as a legacy, as a piece of heritage. So who is this biblical figure? Hmm? Moses. Moses, that's right. Maybe one of the most epic leaders and entrepreneurs in the Bible or ever. Let's look at Moses as an entrepreneur. I want to stop this talk with this context. So at first Moses did not dream to free his people. <laughs> I don't know how much you remember from the story in the Old Testament, but he grew up in the palace. He was royalty. He grew up with Pharaoh, but everybody knew he was not born royalty. He also knew that he was that kid that he found on the River Nile. So I believe that in, when we talk about entrepreneurship, knowing who you are, where you came from, is crucial for you not only to not fail, but to succeed. So know thyself is key. Okay. Um, here's the part that a lot of people tend to forget. Moses has been to the desert before the Exodus. There was this incident, he had to fly away from Egypt, he had to run away, he went to the desert, uh, went to the land of Midian, lived with them, hung up with this fellow Jethro, married his daughter. He was a bad one for quite a few hundred years before he came back to Egypt to free the Israelites. So he knew the place he was going to lead them to. So, I believe that you really have to know your market before you're stepping into it. Not just research it here and there, you have to live it and feel it. So Moses did that. Here's a part that I, found, I find super relevant for young professionals today. Giving Pharaoh the finger is easy. I'm done with this company. I had the culture of this place. My boss is basically, I'm going to quit and start doing my own thing. Or, in a later version, I get my best years to this place. I'm a distinctive partner, uh, distinguished partner. Um, a lot of the customers are here because of me. I'm going to go ahead and start my own shop. It's about time. These things are easy. Even executing them in the beginning is easy. You step into the desert, you're fine, you're strong, you have water, you have food, you're optimistic, that's great. For some entrepreneurs, they have some beginner's luck. Like you get to the Red Sea. It'll split into two for you. That happens for the 1% of us. Right? 
We launched our beta version and it went viral. Great. And now what? So even if you have one percent, later on you face the real desert of reality. And the desert, my country is half of it, um, half of my country is a desert. The desert is not an easy place. There's no food, no water, no shade. It's hot during the day, cold during the night. The desert is unforgiving and tough, and it doesn't care about your problems, your Bedouins. Just like the market. And that land you're trying to reach, well, we'll get to that in a second, but even if you're not alone, you have your team and work together in this, or a bunch of partners, that's great. Sometimes they may disappoint you, sometimes they surprise you for the better, but if you're number one, if you're the founder, if you're the leader and it's all on your shoulders, then at the end of the day, you go first, you see deserts ahead, you look up, you see the Milky Way, and you feel very much alone. Not a lot of people talk about how lonely entrepreneurship is. And that land, that's not the Garden of Eden, let's not be confused. That land is gone, we ate from the apple. We should aspire to get as close as we can to it. You know, the values that we have as companies, our mission statement, we never reach it, but it's guiding us. The promised land is a real place with everyday problems. So when we get to that, let's not be disappointed because we thought we were going to get to the Garden of Eden. We have to be realistic, it's business. And this may take longer than you think, like 40 years in the desert. Moses is maybe the worst navigator in history. If you've done math, take a Bedouin with a few good people, with herds and sheep and the whole thing, from Egypt to the land of Israel, a few weeks. 40 years. So sometimes that's what it takes to establish the business you want to establish. And maybe in Moses' case, he never set foot in the promised land. So why do it? And I believe, and that's why I want to start this, that's how I want to start the stock. I believe that when you find something that is really worth winning for, meaning you rather shed blood, sweat, and tears and win for this and not win with other alternatives, when you find something that is worth losing for, meaning if I lose, at least I'm proud of that loss, because it's what I tried to do and not what happened, then you find something that is worth living for, because that's another thing that is very um, 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 common today. We'll start this app, we'll gain users, we'll sell it to somebody and retire before the age of 30. That's not a good career strategy. Just isn't. So we are in this called a longer game. So when you find something that is worth living for, then you really have a chance of pulling off something that is no less than epic. And that's what I want to start with for this talk. So I want to tell you, um, those of you who don't know who I am, a little bit about who I am, give you guys the context uh, for me. I want to talk about or suggest a way for us to look at the world around us if you want a desert. Not in terms of a bad piece of land, but maybe even a land of opportunities. Just the surrounding um, uh, area that we're in. Then I'm going to talk about the clusters, which are, if you want, promised lands. They go for the individual basis for each and every one of us. They go for a community basis, which is what I want to focus on for this talk. I want to connect this um, to Israel just as a case study. Here's a place that went through such a journey. You may say, by mistake, the result is what's known today as Star Nation. What could we learn from this case study? What can Cincinnati take from that to really pound on, to triple down, and to, to grow as a cluster? So that's what I want to get to. And then finish with the bottom line, which is, if you want, some sort of a compass. Something that really helped me and has guided me and may help, I hope, many of you. Um, and also on the community basis, this amazing city. Cool, so that's the part I want to get rid of quickly. My name is Asaf Luxembourg. I am 33 years old, born and raised in Israel. And I really have two distinctive passions in my professional life, or my life in general. I am super into showing every person that I can the real face of my country, especially in the face of a lot of people who literally sell lies about the place that I'm from. So my mission is to show people what we're all about and what's the value we can bring so that you can decide for yourself. And the second thing is the future of my people. You can 
call this patriotism or community involvement. That's really what I'm all about. Up until I was 23 years old, I was not all about that. I was a musician. These were early 2000s in Israel. This was my room. I taught myself sound design. Back in those days, some 400,000 years ago, people in Israel thought that hip hop in Hebrew is cool. <laughs> it was fake. But a lot of these wannabe hip hop artists were in my high school. So I was their producer. So I was cool once, mind you. Not anymore. By the way, for those of you who are a little bit younger, we used to have these kinds of screens. Well, never mind. An old, forgotten world. So that was me. By the age of 23, I participate in this amazing conference by this amazing organization that is all about social entrepreneurship. And I have my eureka moment, my aha moment. And I realized, that's not who I want to be. 25, 35, 45, not what I want is a legacy at 85. I really care about these things. I never did something with them, but they were there the entire time. They're part of who I am and my passions. So I want to do something about them. So I need to get a job, I'm 23 years old. Um, in Israel, that's when you go to the university after an army service. So which people get paid to represent their country? <coughs> ambassadors. I should go and be an ambassador. That's how I pursue my passion. So I go to study political science and economics, no philosophy, um, in Jerusalem. And I know then what all of your students know, all the students here, your students, or students are here, we all know this today. GPA is super important. Practical experimental experiences, like the Settler program here, the Yale MBA program, and many others are important too. This was not around when I was at Hebrew U in Jerusalem, so I went to work for like a third of the pay that I could have made, but in organizations that will give me this network and the understanding and the skills that I want to become an ambassador. Nonprofits that matter. Um, I work for the government. I work for you know, entrepreneurial organizations with startups. And I also went to work for large corporations to see how the big guys do business, marketing, strategy, sales, because I'm going to need that later on. So I was the man with a plan. That was my plan for you know, my 20s. And along the way, as a young economist that was in the Ministry of Finance and later on went to the private sector, um, I started getting these requests from all these business delegations that are coming to Israel. They started to come more and more and more. Um, so we're bringing a group of entrepreneurs from China or investors from Latin America or uh, MBA students from the US, or business people from Europe, or policy makers from Spain, or whatever you wish, um, uh, from all over the world. Can you meet them and explain to them what's going on here, how does it work, a little bit about the background, of, you know, things that are important for us to know as we come here for this conference, for these business meetings, and so on and so forth. To which I said, sure, I'm going to do a lot. I have zero experience in public speaking. I remember my first time I almost peed my pants on stage. Um, but I'm going to need that later on. I have the best OJD on job training I can ever ask for. So I'm going to do it as much as I can on my free time. So I was really the man with a plan. And then 30 happened. At the age of 30, that's another thing that's related to entrepreneurship. I found out that there are these incidents in all of our lives when we plan, I, I plan, plan, so we plan, then the big boss laughs, and then we cry. <laughs> right? Like we have this entire strategic plan and this entire um, business plan, and we go and we do the research and we sit in the basement and we put our head down and we build a good product and we go out to the market and the market says no. Happens. So obviously you can understand I am not an ambassador and I kind of lost my career destiny when I was 29 and a half. Not a happy moment for me. That's my wife. So I cried. Why did the big boss laugh? Maybe because this whole thing became eventually my business. The last thing that I thought I would do is start my own business and be a, what they call today, a solo entrepreneur. And have my own consulting um, 
um, business, providing content, consulting for Israeli startups, and basically doing what I love just by myself. So I literally became an ambassador on behalf of myself. So I do a lot of things with a lot of organizations that I really don't see as my customers. These are good friends of mine. I'm all about what they do. I work with startup programs from all over the world. Um, I work with companies in Israel that bring all these delegations, and what they do is just epic to me. I work with schools from all over the world. Xavier is one of them, and has been a great uh, um, partner for the past few years. I work with many schools, so I get to compare and you know draw and see what's different and what's not. And I really think the school is doing a lot of things right. Um, that's what brought me to be a CEO of Startup for two years. Not what I planned to do, but I did it for two years. I was a non-founder CEO and pre-seed startup um, for two years. We brought, we got the early revenues, and then something strategic happened, and we had to shut down. I haven't. I work with um, organizations like TechStars. I work with Israeli startups like Silo. Uh, some students here heard about Silo this week. The lessons from our journey as a startup. So that's a little bit about what I do. So to wrap it up, I'm an independent consultant and speaker. I led a startup for two years as CEO. And I have a laser-focused passion in my professional career. And the punchline is I learned on my skin the importance of differentiating and separating between the what and the how and the why. I realized only later on, after a lot of pain, that the reason I wanted to be an ambassador was to pursue my passions. I can still pursue them. The what and how, that's the being an ambassador. And if that road is walked to the top of the mountain, I'll take the machete, I'll go to the bushes, I'll carve my own way up, but I'm still after this top of the mountain. That why. And I think that connects a lot to what I want to talk about. So that's me. A little bit about the world around us, that desert environment, which is all about times of change. So here's something you all feel on a daily basis, but we don't really talk about that much, because we're kind of like that frog in the water, and the water's boiling up quickly, we don't notice it. So, I want to talk about this side of this slide because I can only imagine that the folks that lived through the Industrial Revolution did not say, oh yes, we live in times of change through the Industrial Revolution. They were born in the village, a lot of things changed quickly, they had to move into towns that became big cities. They did not grow tomatoes and potatoes in the backyard, they went to work in big factories to get a salary and not sell their goods in the market. They could not teach their kids in their house, so they had to put the kids in a school. And by the time they became grown-ups, the world slept <coughs> on them. And they slept with it. But they didn't notice that. And we live through the exact same thing. It's not an industrial revolution, it's an information revolution. We talk about it every now and then, but we don't understand how our lives are changing that quickly. Like, a lot of the people here remember the world before the internet. I don't know if some of you can really understand what the world was before the internet, but it was only 20-something years ago. You all have smartphones in your pockets. I hope they're on silent mode, but these are not really smartphones. It's a computer that call. You all have cars that have some software. You will not have smart cars or self-driving cars or um, um, these sorts of things in a few years, you will have computers that drive you around. So our lives are changing really quickly. Those smartphones you have, you didn't have them only seven years ago. Social media did not exist ten years ago. It was only ten years ago. So we don't notice that we live in times of change. And technology advances fast and culture adapts just like our grand-grandparents had. So we find ourselves in a new world of work, which is something a lot of schools, undergrads, and BAs deal with and think about all the time. The world out there that we send our students to, which changed. It's 
not what we grew up into. It's not about jobs anymore, it's about careers. It used to be that your job was your career. Today, it's totally different. Things that we took for granted as constant are now changing all the time. And things that we thought, yeah, that changes all the time, that becomes permanent. Here's a way to understand it. Today it's all about the value of your reputation and your brand. Here's an example. In the past, we used to study a profession. Then we went to work in a company where we can exercise that profession. So we gained expertise in that profession. So we became masters in our jobs. Therefore, the employer-employee relationship was like a sacred marriage. That's what our grand-grandparents did. They worked for a certain company, which was all about the factory and the HQ, and the company provided health care. And we all lived in the same city, so the city was colored by this company or what have you. This was a sacred You don't leave this place. This place is part of who you are. So people would ask other people, where do you work? Or more accurately, who do you work for? Today, we still go to the same school and have the same important classes. But what we really do is we acquire skills to prepare us for, a, for an ever-changing desert. We join a certain community, a business community, and we start developing a professional network. And we become masters in our business, not in our expertise. So a lawyer may have been a professional that becomes a professional in the field of law. Today, you could go work for a law firm. You'll be in the real estate department. You start working with real estate developers and investors. You may go work for them later on, and you find yourself with a career in real estate. You being a lawyer is your value to this community, this industry, this sector. So the employer-employee relationship is super short today. It's transactional. So people ask people, what do you do? Because where do you work? You change all the time. On two years average. And the punchline of this is that today we have to think of ourselves as independent, profit and loss business units. We are all business units in the on-demand economy. It's part of that change. Your boss, I believe, is your customer. Your team members and your fellow co-workers are your consumers. Don't just check the boxes and do them faster and better and expect a promotion. Make sure the customer is satisfied so they want to buy more of you. Make sure that cons consumers want to consume more of you. So you always have to ask, what can I do that other people really need? And that could change. You need to know who you are to tell others about who you are and what is the value that you can bring to them. So these things are super important. You have to belong to a certain community because you can't do it as a professional individual. You have to be part of that. So it turns out that our careers are not the, set, the random set of jobs we held. Just like a good sentence is not a random set of words. You need a certain context. And for that context, we need these things. So the whole meaning of career today, I believe, changes a lot. So there's a lot of disruption out there beyond the world of work. This is just an example. And disruption allows a lot of creation. And that's why innovation really, really matters. Innovation was around in the 70s too. But it's much more relevant to our everyday lives today. That's why we're talking about this right now. And culture adapts. So we have new superheroes in our culture. Because it used to be that those who dropped out to start a business were losers. They did not graduate and go to work for Wall Street. <coughs> they started their own business. Successful, but they never graduated. Today, the Steve Jobs and the Mark Zuckerbergs and the others became heroes. So culture changes. It will keep on changing. They may not be superheroes in our culture forever. It may be just a phase in that overall information revolution, just like our grandparents had. 
So these are times of change. And I really want to get to talk about this, which I believe is super important. There are infinite amount of promised lands out there. But here's a way that I suggest we understand them. First of all, what's innovation? Well, so I matched up a few um, formal <laughs> definitions. It's the introduction of something new, a new idea, method, or device, the production and adoption of better solutions to meet new requirements and needs, so it can be both a process as an end and outcome. Just picked it up online. So it's all about creation. So you need freedom of thought to do that. And for that, you need a supportive environment. You have, you must have a supportive environment. So the word you hear, you hear all the time is ecosystem in the context of startups, entrepreneurship, and business. Now, this is an academic institution, so I did the research. The academic term is actually clusters. And this person maybe you teach him every now and then. His name is Michael Porter. And you can know him from the five forces of Michael Porter. <laughs> That's what we call it. We call it after his name. He's more modest. But he wrote, he did other things too, and he wrote The Competitive Advantage of Nations in 1990. That's not yesterday. Um, here's another one that people who study economics may come across. His name is Paul Krugman. He wrote Geography and Trade in 1991. So the field of clusters as a research field is far from new. So here's the definition of a cluster. It's a geographical location where enough resources and competences amass and they reach a critical threshold, giving that geographical location a key position in a given branch of activity or industry. So that geographical location is able to produce a sustainable competitive advantage over other places, maybe even a world supremacy in that field. Now, there are no examples of clusters, ecosystems out there. I think the most known one, if you really think broad, the most known cluster around the world, historically, is in the United States, right over there. <coughs> What's that cluster? No, I knew you were going to say that. Hollywood. When you think about it, the ability of Joe Schmo or Michelle to literally chase them around physically, Steven Spielberg, after he ignored all their emails and whatever, and literally say, Mr. Spielberg, and ambush them around the corner from the cafe and say, Mr. Spielberg, please read my script, which the Air Force doesn't do, throws it into his car. But two months later, he reads that and it becomes a Cinderella story of the best big movie and he you know, discover that screenwriter. For that to happen, you need to be in a geographical condensed location. It can't be global. It just can't. And we're human beings. We're still not entirely virtual. <coughs> we're physical beings. So it needs to be physically in a geographically condensed place. That's Hollywood. Hollywood is known for that. So they attract people with the same mindset for that industry from all over the world. Because if you want to make it, you have to go to Hollywood. So it's an ever repeating circle. More people come to Hollywood for that cluster, so Hollywood grows bigger as that cluster. Another known one on the other side of this great nation is, of course, <coughs> hmm? Wall Street, that's right. Has its own culture, for good or for bad. But it's a world supremacy in the field. And of course, Silicon Valley. There's a certain common belief in Silicon Valley, if you study that sociologically, because people there honestly believe that they can make the world a better place through technology. So in a way, people over there are trying to pull the future into the present. We want to advance the human race faster push the human race forward. There's that belief technology can solve the human condition. There's that. We're not afraid of great changes. There's that. And it draws people of that mindset to Silicon Valley. 
And for consumers out there, for Javier in Latin America, for Moshe in Israel, for uh, Jacqueline in France, and for Ying Chen in China, what is Cincinnati all about? That's a question I want to come back to a little bit later on, but that's the idea of clusters and what they really mean, because this is big money. There's a competition across ecosystems and clusters <coughs> in geographical locations and cities. And if you go to the other side of the planet, Europe has a lot of clusters. One of them, many of them are there, one known ecosystem that emerged in popular culture in the past 10 years is Israel. How many people here have never heard about this book? Ever. One, two, three. Three, four. All the rest of you have heard about this book. How many people here read it? Aha. So most of you have heard about it, but you did not read it. Which makes sense. Actually, proving my point, that's how powerful this brand became. I've never read Moby Dick, but I can sure tell you about Captain Ahab, the way of the ocean, about and how it's probably a story of persistence. I've never read it. You probably knew that too, even without reading it. That's the power of brands and what they mean to us. This is a book that was published nearly 10 years ago. It took something that was already real, that a lot of people in tech land knew, but it brought that story to a broader context, to the entire business landscape all over the world. Um, so Israel became known to be start nation. Mind you, it's not tech nation, it's not tech corporate nations, it's not the Silicon Valley, it's for startups. So I want to tell you a little bit about that, just as a case study, so we could reflect back on my previous question on Cincinnati. When you think of Israel, or when the average person who knows nothing about Israel thinks of Israel, they may not think of startups first. Like, they may think of homeland first, that's the best of all cases, or they may think of this weird black wearing Jewish ninja who is Amish monks, because it's a Jewish state, so you don't know nothing about what these people are up to, but they do it over there, in Israel, and in Brooklyn. Because when I was in York, I saw one. But I have no idea what these guys are up to. Super weird for me, but there's that. Israel is in the desert, so they probably have a lot of nothing. And it's the world capital of bad news. Right? The conflict. Not a place that seems like, you know, a good ground for stars. More than that, Israel is super small, like it's not in the market, but it's not an attractive market. You want to figure out Israel, regardless of these four photos, take New Jersey. Anybody here from New Jersey? Great, so, oh, two. <laughs> Sorry. So take New Jersey, strip it off continental America, throw it in the middle of the Pacific, but not as a state, as a sovereign country with its 8 million people-ish, more or less, right? You have your own government. How will that survive in the middle of the Pacific? Is an island. So that's basically Israel. Do you want to tell me that this is relevant for startups, innovation, and entrepreneurship? Come on. But then again, Israel did manage to accomplish that. And that should be a, like, it's like a little engine that could, if you want. We didn't um, plan for this. The book tells you all about this. We actually did it by mistake. We tried to solve something else, and we failed badly, but then this grew on us, somewhere in, from the mid-90s. Israel is one of the places with the highest density of startups per capita in the world. That's not only a good thing for this startup right here, because it's very competitive. So how did it happen? By the way, innovation is not just about startups. If you ask me historically, the best innovation that came out of my country is a proven innovation that works over time. It has nothing to do with technology at all. Up until the mid-80s, Israel was not the way you think of it today. We were not good friends with David Liberty. We were more near to this red star. 
My country started as a socialist country. We were never fully communist, but the roots of the modern state of Israel are very red. And the biggest innovation that came from that era is still around today. It inspires companies like WeWorks and others in the shared economy, because suddenly there's a modern version of sharing in this on-demand economy. They're still around. They're not what they used to be. They had to adapt, to change, to survive and thrive. Many of them own land. <coughs> own is a big no-no word what this was. They own companies, equity, investment. They sold companies. They came up with innovative things like metaphane and drip irrigation. This is not the kibbutz that the founding fathers wanted, but it's the kibbutz that thrives. Not all of them thrive, but they thrive. And you won't find one kibbutz in the former USSR. And you will not find one kibbutz in China. It was a modern, it was a, um, a local version of an adaptation because if the theory books of land do not work, we'll figure out a way to make them work. That's innovation to me. And then Israel all went all the way to that side of the scale. Some will say too much. I know a lot of countries in the eastern side of Europe that looked at the world in 1990 as the USSR collapsed and were looking for a new way. For them to move from here to here, it means a civil war. Many of them had. Some of them collapsed. Changing from here to here or back and forth on this axis it is not an easy thing to do. So I'm not an American, but I have a lot of American friends. So when Obamacare was a big issue and it was on the table, there were a lot of people, whether you agree with them or not, that said that doing this is un-American. Whether you agree with that or not, the fact that that claim was accepted on the discussion means something to me. No one said that changing from all the way here to all the way here in Israel is a non-Israeli thing to do. That ability to change on this axis back and forth allows for a lot of innovation to score. And there's a reason why this happens, and I want to get to that. So how does it happen? The book really describes this. If you really don't want to read the book, go online. There's this website called Google. <laughs> all of it is over there. They have this nice website also called YouTube. So you can also watch that. So I'm not going to spew out what the book already says. What I am going to do is tell you what the book touched on briefly and moved on, and I think that's the big punchline. And the punchline is cultural. Cultural matters. Those of you who have been to Israel probably came to meet and interacted with each and every one of the cartoons on my slide. Because most Israelis do not talk and behave like I am with you right now. Um, those of you who may not be to Israel, Israel is not the, you know, the Israeli attitude is somewhat different than the warm Midwest hospitality um, attitude. We're not the most polite people around. We tend to be very direct, sometimes in an inconvenient way. Um, we'll tell you what we think right in your face. We won't even let you finish the sentence. We'll cut you off. There's this energetic thing in Israel. Everything is in a rush. If you ever saw Israelis drive in Israel, then you know what I'm talking about. Standing in line is Israel has a different geometrical understanding than standing in line here. So if this is the entry in Israel, there is no line. It's actually a triangle because everybody's looking for a shortcut. Um, it's different for good or for bad. That Israeli audacity to not accept no as an answer, that could be a bad thing. All well, these things are not a good culture um, when you try to run a government or a municipality or a big corporate when you rely on compliance and legacy. But they're very good for startups. <coughs> so for good or for bad, when that caught on, we had a culture that was fit when it was there before. And Israel is mostly 
not startup nation. Startup nation is just one thing in Israel. LA is not only Hollywood, New York is not only Wall Street, it's the Big Apple in general, and San Francisco is more than just Silicon Valley. But it's that thing that makes it unique in a way that the market accepts. How many people here have been to Paris? Paris is far from being romantic, as Parisians. But when you were there, you made it romantic. You came there in your honeymoon to make romance in Paris. You make Paris romantic with that wine and that restaurant and the baguette and the <coughs> and the Louvre and all that. The fine arts, the fashion. You do it. You know who invented romantic Paris? Hollywood. Not the Parisians. So for the same way, it, that thing makes Israel unique. Now, what is that thing that allows Stark Nation or Romance in Paris, what is that thing that allows it to spur out, that makes Israel all the other things do, for good or for bad? What's that thing that allowed this industry to be in Hollywood, in LA? It could have been somewhere else. Why there? What's that thing that made you know, Brazil all about fun? There were other places that are fun. Most Brazilians don't live fun lives. But for us, it's carnival and sports and all those things. So what is the real DNA of the culture that allows for good things to become clusters and for other things to not become good? But they exist too. The true DNA of that culture. So in the case study that, of the country that I'm from, a lot of people, a lot of them are not Israelis, when they research this, they said, you know, when we look upon the broader picture, and we ask why this, of all industries, and why there of all places, <coughs> then we say, you know, there's something in Israel that produces a lot of creative energy. There were research companies that researched that some 10 years ago, before the book was written, and they came with that answer, which I believe is somewhat true, it's very true. Because my country is all about smashing extremes. Israel is a place that takes extremes and smashes them all the time. Religious and secular, old and new, Jewish and Arab, hot and cold, left and right along the axis we saw. All of them. When you take two atoms in a nuclear accelerator and you smash them together, in a small amount of space, because Israel is super small, and in an incremental amount of time, because we're, we're going to be only 70 years old in May, <coughs> thousands of years of history, but the modern state is less than 70 years old. What do you get in that nuclear accelerator when you smash those atoms together? What is being released? Energy. energy. That's right. Now, if that energy is not handled correctly, the whole thing could explode, right? Half of Geneva will go because of CERN. Right? People were afraid there's going to be like a, we're going to create a black hole here. It's dangerous. It's a lot of energy. According to research, Israel should have had like more than one civil war already. Ask any political scientist. We have all the characteristics on the equation, just like half of Africa and most of the Middle East nowadays. There are many countries that were there in the past are not here anymore. Why did it happen? It didn't happen yet. And there are two reasons for why it happened. And I want to share two of them with you. What are the roots of creative energy? The first one is the home factor. Israel has a no bullshit attitude because Israel people, everybody knows everyone in a way. It's a small country. And you will not be able to make an impression by putting on a nice shirt and come with nice pants. It won't work. It can work in other places. Not in Israel. So I'm respectful for tonight, but otherwise I'll be here with a decent t-shirt. The home factor in Israel goes like this. If you are 15 and you come back home from school, you are in your private homes. So if you want to watch TV, that's the queue like a few years back, you want to watch TV, you will not be dressed like me, not sitting like that, and you will not be taking no notes, right? You'll be in your pajamas all over the sofa, right? 
I hope that you feel comfortable in your physical private home. Then you're hungry, so you want to grab something off the fridge. You go to the kitchen and you see your younger sibling taking something off the fridge ahead of you. Will you stand in line waiting for your turn? No. Move me, hungry. That's what you do. Because you're home. That extra politeness is not necessary among people who live together. And then your mom comes home and she tells you you need to clean your room. Do you present logical, consistent, rational arguments to her, trying to persuade to her why you can clean your room later? No, you shout, no mom, I hate you, and just slam the door. No, she's a grown up. Is she approaching the podium, presenting logical, consistent arguments for you? Why well, it's important for your education to learn to clean your room? No, she had a bad day at the office. She shouts back at you. You will never do those things in the public sphere. The public sphere is sacred. It belongs to everyone. So it belongs to no one. We should respect it. But in Israel, the public sphere belongs to everyone, so it belongs to me too. So I am going to come with a jeans and sneakers to the bank and sit like that in front of the bank with this side of the shoe facing him or her when I come to ask for a loan. And when we drive, we do not wait patiently for our turn. We say, move me now. And when we debate in the boardroom, professional as it may be, this is emotional, not rational. Because we all know each other. I'm not going to persuade anyone in Israel dressed like this. Why are you coming dressed like this? I know your parents when they were this and that. Come on. You think that will get you a yes for me? That's insulting in Israel. So the home factor puts down a lot of formalities and legacies. Israel is a place that has no legacy as a system in many ways. So that's the home factor, the ability to be in the public sphere just like you are in the public sphere and not get offended when people do the same to you. The other route for creative energy in my country, which I believe is the main source for that culture that allows starvation to happen, is the sense of purpose, the common sense of purpose. My country, for good or for bad, is not an individualistic country where we are taught to pursue our own professional and or our own private happiness and fulfillment. In my country, we are grown to think and to feel that we are part of something that is bigger than us. So our personal failures don't matter so much. So we can take risks. That is real in Israel. Some people don't like that. It's heavy on them. They want to go live in America so they can you know, be the rock star of their own movie, the movie star of their own lives. Some people are drawn to that. But it's real. Israel has that. Your ability to understand that you're part of something bigger than yourself, so your community, your industry, your company in general, if you're attached to that, that's where innovation comes from. And that's what I want to talk about if I want to connect the way I think we should look at the world around us to what the importance of clusters have today. Here's something that could serve as a compass. So I think know thyself is super important for the personal level and for the community level, this city. And in the Hebrew or Jewish version of it, know where you came from because you do have a legacy and heritage. And that will help you understand where you're going to understand what you should innovate, not how. And who are you going to give justice to in the end. And this is super important to grow innovation clusters. There's a very famous YouTube talk by a person called Simon Sinek called Start With Why. That influenced me a lot. When you find that true why, why are we doing what we're doing? What are the passions that drive us? That allows us to innovate. Because that why can never change. That becomes a constant in the equation. 
And if that why never changes, that why better be real, better be genuine for you personally, and for this city, or this school, or this country. You have to fall in love with that why. If that why doesn't change, then the what and the how can change. They have to have the ability to change. And if they can change, that's where creation comes from. From the ability of the how and the what to change. To not be romantic about this product or this service. Because times are changing, the market's changing, our customers are changing. It's the why that's matter. that matters. That never changes. If the why changes, we need to think of ourselves. We need to ask ourselves, well, so why are we doing this business? Why not something else? The why shouldn't change. When the power and why change, the creation emerges. Thinking outside the box emerges. Innovation emerges. And when you think into that why, you find a calling. And then you realize you're not alone. There are others with the same calling. So you're part of a community. So you're able to start growing an ecosystem. You're bringing these people to that geographical location. And you're building a strong cluster. So how can you figure out that why? So going, up to, going back to this conference by this organization, that I attended when I was 23 years old. That same organization that also helped a lot for me to stand here and talk to you today. So that's another opportunity to thank them, the ROI community. Going back to that conference in Jerusalem in 2008, here's something that really helped me. That's the last academic figure I'm going to show tonight. So this person's name is Jim Collins. <coughs> This famous book where he introduces the hedgehog concept that has many ingredients but also um, has the following idea. These are three circles. Each has a circle, has a center that is out of the other two. And there are shared zones, two, two, and two, and one shared zone in the middle. And those three circles of Jim Collins, the hedgehog concept, that I heard for the first time when I was 23 years old that gave me my aha moment of my career. <clears throat> they work like this. One's your passion, the other one is your competitive advantage, and the third one is the economic drive. The blue one is what you really want to do. This pink one is what are you the best at better than anyone else. And the green one is, what's the economic structure that can allow us to thrive? Because if we're starving, then we're not allowed, then we will just not be able to accomplish the other things. So it works like this. On an individual basis, you may really, really love ballet dancing. You would want to do it for life. The problem is, you really suck at it. <laughs> So people will not be willing to pay you to do that. Pursue your passion, this sounds very nice, but may not be pragmatic in your case. You have to be realistic. Because the market like the desert is tough and unforgiving. Here's another one. You need to exploit your potential. If you're the best in the world in running because you run super fast, go be a professional athlete. Exploit your potential. A lot of young professionals hear that from their parents, their teachers, and so on and so forth. Well, what if you don't like running? <coughs> There's going to be someone else that less bets better, better at this than you, but they're more persistent. They really like it. They will train more, and they will be better. You will not be able to exploit your potential if you will not be fully devoted to it. Plus, what are you going to do after 35? when your athlete career is over. Do you want to stay in the athletics business? Do you want to be involved in the association and all those things? Do you want to coach? Because if you don't like that, you should start asking hard questions. <clears throat> if it's only that circle, 
without these other two, this may not also bring you to fulfillment. And a lot of young professionals that I get to work with, and I get to work with quite a lot, they have the following thing going on. I'm going to graduate, and then I'm going to ask the market, who's willing to pay me the most? And I'll go do whatever it is they ask, because I have student loans, and I have a reputation, and I want to make more than my friends, and so on and so forth. So they go to work for this place. Two years later, giving the finger to Pharaoh. Right? But <laughs> you quit. And you go back to the market. This time you have those two years of experience. You're expecting more. Who's willing to pay me the most? So you go to work for that company. For the first year, where you have that exponential learning curve, you're on it. And then you get to that plane, the desert. Do you really like that company? Did you go to work for them for the right reasons? Is it really the place for you to bring the best of your value and exploit your potential? And if the answer is, unless it goes up 1%, if the answer is no, you'll quit. And you do that over again, and that's how you end up with a bunch of words with no context, which is not a good career. And then regret comes along. So that's absolutely not, although this is strictly irrational, it's irrational to go and do this without taking this and that into account. If you end up something doing that you're not the best at, and you do not like, you're not happy. And you all know this, because we all go through these stages. So let's talk about that shared zone. That shared zone is where you can find your calling. It may not be the center of your passion, but it has that circle. It may not be the center of your competitive advantage, but it's still something that you could be the best in the world at. And then this economic um, uh, platform that will allow you to grow so you can take care of others because you are good, it will come along. And that allows us to start acting and live according to values that I think are the right way to do it. Like, do well by do good. Like, give first. Like, do what you love. If these organizations don't have the right, we would have never been in WeWork if they didn't really have this as a passion in a shared zone. So this matters. You have to find your shared zone. But not only at an individual level, that's true on an individual level, that's an advice I give a lot of 20 year olds that I get to work with. You won't find it next month, maybe not even next year. Start looking. You need to find that on a community level. So if Paris is all about romance, Brazil is all about fun, LA is all about Hollywood, although it's not really all about Hollywood, but that's the way it is on the market. And Silicon Valley is all about tech. New York is all about Wall Street. And Israel is known for startups. What Cincinnati is all about? Because I can tell you one thing for sure. And I'm going to be honest as Israeli as I can be. Mm -hmm. My Israeli friend that I told him I'm going to Cincinnati, not only they do not know that it's where Procter and Gamble are headquartered, even if they knew that, they don't care. It brings no value to them. But I really believe that every place, every company, every person, every product, every community has something they can be the best in the world at, that they can become a cluster at. It doesn't have to be startups. So startup ecosystems is a very discussed issue today, but clusters can give up anything. So why is Cincinnati destined to be cluster off. What can it be? Not only what should it be, what can it be a cluster off? Because I'll tell you one thing. When you find something that is worth losing for, when you find something that is worth winning for, winning for, and when you find something that is worth losing for, then you find something that is worth living for. And I believe that if you take that to the community basis, and if you start really deep, digging deep, the heritage and the legacy of this place. What makes this place different 
in India, Columbus, Pittsburgh, or other places. But can this place really be a beacon of so that people who have the same mindset will come to this place? So it will be an ever repeating circle. That's when we're really able to grow an epic cluster. So if it's true for the individual basis, I believe it's true for the community basis. My country discovered it by mistake. You can do it, not by mistake. I met a man this week um, who has this in his office. Purpose of life is a life of purpose. If you go around to find purpose in what you're trying this place, to make this place, and you need to see how you bring purpose into that. That's true for your individual level, with your careers, but I believe it's also true for this great city that it has more than one ingredient to become a great cluster at. So we need to think about these things. It should be on our mind because there's a competition out there. And if you will not do it, someone else will do it for what you could have been a cluster of. So do it. Thank you. Competitors to collaborate. I don't want to 
hang with you with my competitor, or I want to beat you, and then help you be second to me. So that's just an idea, and it exists in many industries. So in Silicon Valley, it's maybe more um, uh, dominant than other clusters, where it's really competitive, you really want to kill your competition, like other <coughs> clusters. That's a matter of culture. So if you have those ingredients, we, the people of Cincinnati, we want to strengthen our city, we want to strengthen our communities, we want to come together, find that thing that we're all about, and push that to the market, show who we really are so they will decide for themselves. And those who agree with those values we present as who we are, they want to come and join us. That's the culture of innovation. Because if you focus on that line, the how and what can change. That's why we're able to play around with new ideas and new methods. It's the why that doesn't change. I'm innovating and I'm trying things for this why. Does that? Great. Any more questions? Yes, please. You talked about um, you know, these different clusters and you know, Hollywood and Wall Street and you know, Tel Aviv and stuff like that. But has there ever been like, a catalyst like there was in Israel such more recently? You know, we had the was it, Six Day War. That was a big catalyst for change in the country and it really hasn't slowed down. And in Hollywood, have you seen any semblance of what a catalyst is that kind of make these clusters right. kind of tighter? What's your name? Aaron. Aaron, thank you for the question. So, um, first of all, I'm sure there are many. Um, by the way, in the case of Israel, I don't think it's the big wars, like the big, you know, 60s, 70s wars. I think it's the economic crisis that we had in the 80s. They had to push Israel to say, enough is enough. You have to innovate the whole way. You have to really switch your entire how and what. We were not sure about the why, by the way, if you ask me. But what allowed us to move from this red star to dear late liberty without having six civil wars in the middle is because there was such a why. So yes, we used to be people's nation. Now we're going to be super liberal nations. We want to bring America, having you know shopping malls. We want to you know, change the whole economy. It's because of the big crisis that was in the eighties, more or less around when I was born. So I think that was a big change. And to answer the other part of your, uh, that was a big catalyst in Israel. Not something that more a lot of people are knowledgeable about, but it was that economic crisis um, because we really had no other choice but to innovate our economy. For the second part of your question, so here's a famous example that one of my gurus um, presented in one of his talks, and I've learned it from him. And he tells a story about New York. New York in the 70s was not the big apple. Not in the consumer's mind. New York in the 70s was Gotham City. Crime, <coughs> corrupted, dangerous. We don't want to live there. Far from temptation and big and blinding lights will inspire you in New York, Times Square, the Big Apple, grab life, embrace it, and all that. And he tells the story how uh, there were people who really loved New York. It hurt them, you know, they were painful in how America and the world see New York, which is absolutely wrong for what New York really is. They live there. We know. That's not the real New York. We must find a way to show who we are for them. They literally built an association, it was called the Association for a Better New York or something like that. It looked the exact name. And they really, you know, it was like a lobby group at the end of the day, a nonprofit that helped the businesses, that helped them other nonprofits, that helped the municipality, that you know communicated with Hollywood, communicated, you know, try to you know, understand what the culture can we do. TV shows and movies and books, to, to, not to trick people to buy something else, but to show them that the real they thought of is not the real thing. Or if it was cleaning the streets of New York, you know, there's that too. That, you know, you need to have a good, good product, not just good marketing. But we want to communicate who we are for real. So it's kind of similar to, you know, I'm very passionate about that for my country. I literally want each and every one of you to understand that my country is not the first impression you probably had. So what you will be intrigued to maybe 
learn a little bit more. But even not, you got some value out of me that got you to think about your own careers. So then you say, hey, you know that is really, you know, what he talked about, yeah, that was interesting. So you know that, that's, that for sure it's not those lies that other people push into, that shove into other people's minds. They're not just lies. That's my point. The New Yorkers had that right. It was the business people, the investors, the people who really care. And they were able to change that because New York today is the big app. So they did it. So there are more examples like that. Spain, Post, Franco, the art. There's a lot about it online. In Israel, we just had it by mistake. We had to solve one problem somewhere in the early 90s. We had to come up with innovative policies <coughs> to solve that problem. There's no country ever faced something like that in that scope, in that context. So we have to pull a Hail Mary. It failed, but it helps our mission grow. And the book tells you all about that. But there are other stories like that. You don't wait for something that will force you to innovate. Don't wait for, don't wait for you know, necessity is the mother of all innovation. Do it from a place of strength. That's an advantage. Take advantage of it. I don't want Columbus to do it for you. Or instead of me. If that helps you. Yes. <coughs> Please. Hey. Um, so, Sok, one of the things, and I know tonight you're, you're focused primarily on uh, innovation. Uh, yes. But, you know, one of the things that struck me when we met, like, uh, over the summer in Israel is it, it felt like the, the whole country, especially Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, were just, everybody was, was you know, really focused on innovation. The beginning of the product life cycle, we're just launching stuff left and right. Well, no offense, Tom. No but, it, but, in, <laughs> but in America, it feels like we're we're really better at that. You know, how do we grow something over the, the longer term? What is it that we as Americans can do? Can we do to learn more in this space? And we talk about startups all the time, but I so think the cowboys of the day, right? Yeah. But they may not be cool tomorrow. What can we as Americans do to, I guess, get better focus to be more like Israel, maybe, in this space? Um, so first of all, so I may surprise you with my answer. I don't think you should aspire to become like Israel. I think you should be a, you know, be a better version of yourself. Be a, the best America you can be, right? I can help you maybe by mirroring and showing you how other cultures, you know, react and play and, and behave. But you need to be the best you you can be. Now, you have innovative clusters. <laughs> you have them. You lead the world and for a reason. So here's my answer for you. When I observe my culture, so know where you come from in order to discover where you're going, I really try to, you know, I really believe that. So I look at, you know, the roots of my country and my people, um, my culture. So from, you know, the land of Israel in the Bible, to you know the story, the history of the land of Israel, you know, after biblical times, to Jewish communities. We were always good at doing things small. Startups are small. Jewish communities are small. They have to learn how to adapt in an ever-changing environment and react and try new things. We were never Rome. Never. We were never an empire. We will never be. We were always small. We will be always small. So innovation is good for that. 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, one God was a very innovative thing. A lot of people did not accept that. So there are many versions of that. You are Rome in a way. You're an empire. You don't need to behave like a startup. So I'll give you an example. That innovative culture that you saw in Israel and, and you saw that in your face that that's real, that's not good on all fronts. Try to run a municipality with that who do you think you are, I can come up with a better policy, that, that's a, a good way to fail. <laughs> that douchebag before me had this policy, I'm going to change this entire structure and re-innovate taxation. Well, then tax policy changes every three years, go to business in such an environment. That's not good, right? So it's absolutely not good in every front. We need to learn how to be like you in many ways. 
is that mutual fertilization, right, that um, um, relative expertise, as they say in economics, if that's the way you say it in English, where we each have to be the best in what we are. It comes back to these three circles. You have innovation clusters, but overall, this is America. I will always be small, teeny, tiny Israel, which is why my place in the world market will never be the production lines in the East and will never be the big markets in the West. So we may always suck in marketing, which we are, but we have to be good in R&D, because that's what we can really be valuable at. If we we'll try to be great production lines, someone else will do it better than us, because it's their shared zone. It's their why, how, why. So we are fooling ourselves. So maybe we need to be, as long as the market is the way it is, we have to be the best R&D center we can be for the world. So startups are just part of that. But who knows what will be around in 50 years? So that question of, you know, the why is constant and how and what needs to change? Startup nation is a how and what. The why has to be permanent. And it may not be here in 10 or 20 years. So that's my answer to you. So going back to Cincinnati, maybe Cincinnati should not be just another tech ecosystem that the start genome research will evaluate like all the others, because everybody's trying to compete on that same thing. No, go to Kansas City Shuffle, do something else. Hollywood is not a startup ecosystem. They should not aspire to be. They should be a better Hollywood, regardless of all the heat they're getting nowadays. Austin, Texas, I have a lot of friends in Austin. Austin is not trying to just be a tech ecosystem. They said, you know what, we want to be a regional hub, right? So Austin is not Texas in a way. We're going to have this huge conference called South by Southwest, right? Which is more about the arts than the tech itself. But that's where the Twitter is only how to you know, start from. So they gain an expertise in that. They still have a lot to do. Israel still has a lot to do. But you have to take something that is genuine to your DNA. Yes? I was just going to ask so kind of like a follow up on that question. Did you see success breeding success? Like maybe people believing they can do it because their neighbor was able to make of it? Of course. By the way, 99, more than 90% of them will fail. Statistics. That's stars. Right? The thing is, in the culture today, since they became the new cowboys, we all want to be them. I guess a few hundred years ago, there was this rumor in Europe, or the East Coast, that hey, you know, people in the West, you just go there, you know, take a shovel, people find gold. Let's raise money from bankers in Poland, or England, or New York, let's go back to the next mission and find gold. Most people did not find gold. But everybody wanted to be that cow. It built California. But most of them failed. It hurt. Most of them never got to California. It was a dangerous journey. So if, to answer that, most startups will fail. Today, in a, in a zero interest rate, in interest rate environment, and the people just don't have much to do with the yeah, let's give 50K for this kid. That's great for that kid, right? So he can actually try. The cost of entry is zero, because marketing, social media, zero, right? You don't need to buy physical servers, AWS, zero, almost zero. You don't need a license to code today, that's almost entirely for free, zero. So the cost of entry is zero. Everybody can try and be a coward, but most of them will not find gold. Even if the ticket on the train to California is for free. A lot of people, so you will follow a lot of thought leaders like Gary Vaynerchuk, they will stay. A lot of people try to be entrepreneurs today just because it's the cultural cowboy, that they're not putting themselves in a position to succeed. You're not supposed to be an entrepreneur. You could be a much better McKinsey consultant. Go do that. Be honest with yourself. Don't do it because everybody's trying. So there's a lot of that. And in Israel, a lot of people are trying just because everybody's trying. I know I went to Crowley because Crowley did something that is right in my passion. So the way I took the decision, should I leave BDO with my side hustle that was in a small business and go to Crowley? Hmm, okay. 
if I will not take that opportunity that the founders gave me to come be the CEO, with all the complexities that it had, they will give that to someone else, because these founders are also the investors that are getting busy. So someone else will do it. So if Crowley does this without me, and they fail, eh, good that I didn't take it. If I take that option and succeed, great. But let's look at the downsides. What happens if I take that option and we fail, which we did? How painful will it be for me, looking back? Not that much. Not only that, part of the amazing things that we did are still living on and growing some of the projects we were able to do. So we are not here, but the things we did are still out there in the market, alive. What would have happened if I stayed in my Clark Kent job, played Superman with the speech engagement and consulting on the side, but not go for this opportunity to go all in and be a CEO of a startup that is right in the middle of my shared zone. If they would have succeeded without me and I had the opportunity to be the number one CEO and I said, no, I will never forgive myself. So of course I'm going to take that chance. But unfortunately, most entrepreneurs are not in the know thyself mode. They think of what can be a good app that I can do that could get a lot of users fast so we will sell the business after three years so I can retire before the age of 30. Because that's the new power. 99% of them will not get to do that. And they lose time. They will not do the other thing they should have done. That McKinsey job. That will give them that escalation to their career. So if that answers your question, a lot of people try that just because, you know, why do you care? But not necessarily they should. I did not want to be an entrepreneur. I delayed becoming self-employed for almost two years. Yes, you had a question. So you talked about the concept of the home factor. Mm -hmm. uh, can you elaborate how does that help with the culture of innovation? Yes. Um, the fact that you and your brothers and sisters and your parents have a no bullshit attitude in your house as you move together allows you to be very, very open and honest with yourselves. So it allows a lot of fruitful discussions. And when you are in a business delegation um, overseas in a networking event with a suit and tie, meeting other people from other places, you will be polite. You will try to be considerate. It will take a lot of time for both sides to open up and come up with those same fruitful discussions. So Israel has a lot of no bullshit attitude, a bottom line culture, some may say, because we do not see the public sphere the way you see the public sphere. So again, for you, the public sphere is a sacred idea in most of the developed world. We should respect it. This is not your personal home. You cannot behave the way you are in your own personal home. In Israel, if it belongs to everyone and it's a relatively small place, then you're going to be the way you are at home and you're going to be the way you are at home. It's not going to be the same behavior, but you won't be offended by stuff. That's the idea. So it allows for more creativity to happen. You get rid of a lot of, you know, um, um, polite courtesies and a lot of the things. Just put it away. So there's this thing like, yada yada, man. let's go. <laughs> Enough of this courtesy and uh, come on. Let's get to the bottom line. So it allows for creativity to spur up faster. And I think that's great. I think ecosystems and clusters should embrace that, the good parts of that, to put themselves in a position to grow faster. So that the next time that tries to be an ecosystem will be second to you and not you second to them. And that's true, as we spoke before, that's true for India too. Yes. Yes, you. Yeah, um, I have two questions. So the first one is you talked a lot about connecting um, the shared zone, right? Right. But then once that it takes some time to start like reaching that point. But then there's I think you said that you can find that shared zone sort of like community level. So that's the first question you got to elaborate on that. Right. And the second part is basically like um, you know <coughs> About two years ish, I went to graduate, so um, you know, I'm really thinking about jobs and everything. Mm -hmm. I'm mostly, I feel like I'm focusing too much on the what and how. Right. You know, but, like, I can't see. Like, how do you figure out your why? Yeah. That's what you're asking. Yeah. I mean, the how and what are easy. The market will tell you how and what. Right? They see it because. Yeah.
yeah, this job is open, you should take that, or it's not open, this opportunity emerges, or you can go to the MBA here, or like, the market tells you what's available and what's not. The why is internal. So to answer the first part of your question, this shared zone, this three circle concept, three circles of my college, so that's something I heard and I, you know, it really helped me as a compass, right? As a compass um, um, in my personal journey. I think, I think that it's true also at the community level. When I say community, I mean your industry, you and your competition, and the service providers, and the customers too. So the overall community. This could be true as our city. This could be true as you know our church, because we have similar, you know, we're connected together to other churches in other cities, like we're a community, maybe even nationwide. This can be true as, you know, um, you know, me and my fellow expats from my country. You know, you know, people we, we migrated here from other places and we're a community of you know immigrants from that country. So this could be that. This could be a lot of things, but you have to find out people who are like-minded, you're like yourselves. So you could innovate together. That's why a lot of startups sit in those you know, co-working spaces. So beyond the overall marketing and the nice, you know, uh, uh, comfortable environment that they give and the decoration, it's real. Because literally, I, my, I work out of a we work space. People help people, you're part of a community, it's real. So these things are very important. There used to be the saying, you know, you sit in your garage and you come up with a product. Today, you don't want to sit in the garage. You want to sit, you know, in a, in a big garage with other people to fertilize one another. So that shared uh, zone is all about connecting the three circles. And that's true for you personally. But that's also true for the community you see yourself a part of. And if you really look deep inside, the Hollywoods and the Wall Streets and the Silicon Valleys and the others, they kind of have that shared zone figured out. They can be the best in the world at it. So they want us to do it better than them. But they're also persistent because it's their passion. So when you know, the industry is tough, people are not quitting and running away. They're sticking around to stay. Because it's who they are, not where they work. So over time, they grow that competitive advantage, which is the economic circle, <coughs> that allows them to survive the downsides and really thrive during the good times. So that's where the community base is. It could be your, your company's industry. Fall in love with that shared zone, with that why. If you don't like the industry that your company is in, if you're not falling in love with the customers that your company is serving, ask questions. So it's okay to do it for a few years because you need to experience. These are practical reasons. But that's in the learn, that's in the world of jobs, not in the world of careers. So that's the difference between you know the marathons and the sprints, if that makes sense. Yes, you had a question. Yeah. Um, so oftentimes there, oftentimes I run into people who have like great ideas, but they. I'm sorry, can you speak louder, please? I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, oftentimes <laughs> I run into people who have great ideas. And, but it's not the right time for them, right? So, and then, I don't know, everybody in the room may have a great idea, it's just, it may not be the right time for, for them. So, how do you, what do you do when you have a great idea, it's a great time for the market, but it's not a great time for you personally? What do you, what kind of decision do you make, and then, and then what do you suggest in terms of Be the honest transition with yourself. Period? Be honest with yourself, and the tool that I use to do it, I literally draw this, you know, tree that splits into two and then splits into four. Like each one splits into two again. So let's say I say yes and it turns out good or it turns out bad. And let's say I say no and it turns out good and it turns out bad. So if I say yes and it turns out for the better, or if I say no and it turns out for the better, easy. I gamble right, like I bet on the right card. Let's put them aside. What happens if I say yes and it turns out bad? And what happens if I say no and it turns out bad? Which one would I regret more? And that's how we take a lot of decisions. So it's a more risk management point of view to take bold moves. But that's the decision I took. Listen, I had a comfortable job with a growing side business 
Why take the risk doing a seed stage startup where the two founders are also the investors themselves? And you know, they have other things, they get busy, so they want to bring someone else to do it for them. But then again, I'm not a founder, so this creates a lot of complexities. But it's in my shared zone. If probably would have made it and I was not a part of it, I will never forgive myself. It's like your entire life you were in love with connecting people online, and this guy, Zach, smart something, or came to the way and offered you to join this thing called Facebook, and said, Yeah, I'm not at the right time. <laughs> it's not about the money you would have made. It's the opportunity to change the world that you were not a part of that team. It's the legacy, right? It's what you tell your grandkids. So I take a lot of decisions like that because I really see a lot of people and when they have no, like even if they have only the economic circle with their competitive advantage. So it's not only, you know, who's willing to pay me the most, I'm, I'm really good at this. But if there is no even one grain of passion, when the industry will be in tough times, you'll want to quit. You'll not stick around to stay because you don't really care for that industry. If you work for Google and you're not passionate about online advertising, AdWords, AdSense, and these sorts of things, Google will not be cool forever. And you're giving your best years to them. They're not, ah, oh, okay, I'll be an entrepreneur in 50 something. Maybe you won't be. So you lose time. So that's the way I take decisions a lot of times. Don't be you know, blinded by brands and things that really don't mean, that, mean a lot to you. And take decisions. Again, that's my um, way of taking decisions. Based on the long term, not next year. Or I need that experience for the long term, so I'm taking that job for two, three years because I need that. It's like, you know, glad you're a school for me. I don't want to go out to the war unprepared. I need glad you're a school for two, three years. Back to your question. So that's a good strategy to take a certain job. You want that experience, skills, know hows, connections. But know your why. Yes? Something that they're really passionate about. 
If you're able to do it over time, they will be willing to accept lower payments, lower salaries when times are tough. They're able to stay. They just love this industry. So that glue is a certain why. You're helping them fulfill themselves. They never want to leave. So that's a why. So again, if you ground a certain why, you're able to let loose of hows and whats. So a lot of innovation comes. Because people know what the why is. So you say, I want to be you know, known for this why. People who are aligned with that why will come to you. They're looking for you out there. So if that answers your question, whether that's a company or a community or a municipality or whatever that is, pick a why that is true to your DNA, or even a school that is true to your DNA. How can Xavier be different than other Jesuit schools around the country? What makes us unique? We're not better, just different. And we want to be known for that. People who want that come to us. If you absolutely do not want that, it's okay. Go someplace else, don't give you that. But we are for our people, people who want that. And whatever but that thing is to you, your company, your community, and so on and so forth. Does this answer your question? Uh, yeah, I guess the only other portion with it is when you're not in the power base and when you're more trying to get the power, the power base to go along with the implementation okay. of being on the lesser side of it than being on the power side of it. Okay, so I'm interested in learning more, but maybe we'll give some other things. Come to me, look at, we have a networking time, so let's, let's talk about it. Anybody else has a question? Yes. Um, I, I love that you brought in Jim Collins, who is great, and the hedgehog um, concept. Uh, in that book, he really, I think, focuses on that it's not just a quick, you know, fix. That most of those companies actually took about four years to develop a hedgehog strategy. That they tested, they, tested, they tested, they implemented. It. Um, and and you know that's the only thing I see the, the whys also. Because sometimes I don't think the why comes to somebody or an entrepreneur or, somebody, or even a community until a little bit down the road. Right. And there may be an entrepreneur that did a startup, failed, and then he discovered he or she discovered their why. That's um, that's the question. If the person a real entrepreneur, or they just did it because it's cool today, and I don't want to go, you know, take a consulting job, I want to do this. It's, so that goes back to know thyself. Um, by the way, in the hedgehog concept, so there's the hedgehog and the fox, and I'm going to save you guys the time, so you know we can figure that later on. But it's the fox that tries new things all the time. You would guess he would be the innovative one. And no, 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 no. It's the hedgehog that knows what he's good at. Knows when to pull that thing off. He has one trick. It's a one trick pony, a one trick hedgehog. He does this thing, you know, the, uh, the spines come off, and every time the fox is unable to bite him. And the fox can try this angle, that angle, from that tree, or from this valley. It doesn't matter. Because that hedgehog is true to himself. That's what evolution gave me, and that's what I'm going to play with. I can try to fly, but I don't have wings. So I'm realistic. So, grounding that why with know thyself allows you to thrive according to the hedgehog concept. And not just let's try, try things that you know, there's no correlation between one thing and another. That's the idea. Um, I know we're gonna have. I know we have networking time. I'm really happy to answer more questions. I'm here. Um, you're invited to stay. Um, right? Yes. There's food. Great. <laughs> so we can continue this. Guys, thank you very much.